Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Okay, so this lecture series is about cerebellum, um, and it's uh, we'll start with its uh, various uh, anatomical details, look at its uh, functions in detail, uh, structure-wise, correlate that uh, the structure with function, uh, and of course at the end we will look at uh, some clinical correlation of this very important part of CNS. Uh, these pictures uh, uh, are for uh, some learning cues so that it, they just stick in your mind. Uh, there is this uh, 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 probably father or elder brother of this chap here who is teaching him to how to build a tower uh, out of bricks. Uh, this little cute girl uh, is touching her uh, finger to her nose. Uh, this uh, little baby is trying to have a good time with its uh, uh, sibling apparently pulling his hair and this man has is is at peace with himself apparently uh, in complete coordination uh, with himself and his surroundings okay so what is cerebellum cerebellum is the second largest structure of the brain 100 billion neurons through this structure uh, receives proprioception very important point proprioception what is proprioception you should know this now it's joint, tendon, muscle, all of the sensory information uh, regarding movement or while it's stationary, all of this is lumped together under proprioception uh, and it's sent uh, to the cerebellum for various sorts of functions of the cerebellum and, and higher brain structures. Uh, it works uh, together with basal, uh, basal ganglia or basal nuclei and the motor cortex. Okay. Everyday examples, uh, as you saw the cute little girl, uh, you uh, uh, doing intri uh, very intricate uh, movements uh, requires cerebellum. So this maneuver is not possible without the cerebellum being intact. Uh, eating your food with a fork, bringing this food with the fork to your mouth requires cerebellum. Finding keys in your pocket with only your fingers uh, is a cerebellar function as well. Uh, summary, by summary I mean just a, a very superficial summary of the functions of cerebellum is this example is of motor learning, this example is of coordination and this example I find it very cute uh, this is about timing, the hourglass timing and force you can you can you can say timing as well he's he's really placed well on top of the sibling to 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 at great timing and to apply his force to tell the sibling who's boss okay so motor learning coordination of, of the body or different joints during a movement uh, and proper timing and force which is required for each movement all are functions of the cerebellum Right, so these are the two diagrams which I have uh, discussed previously uh, in when, I, when we were discussing descending motor tracts. However, they are pertinent here as well because they mention uh, our interest which is the cerebellum uh, in, in this lecture series. Uh, I would like you to uh, take a close look at where the cerebellum is placed in this schematic diagram and its connections with the rest of it. So, cerebellum has a lot of communication with brainstem as mentioned earlier uh, and brainstem of course has a lot of interaction with cerebral cortex and the spinal cord. Now cerebellum directly does not interact with the spinal cord, it interacts with the spinal cord via the brainstem, something that needs to be remembered. Also cerebellum uh, has, an, has a very extensive uh, feedback and also uh, uh, afferent and efferent input via the thalamus and the cerebral cortex and also from the cerebral cortex into the brainstem and then into the cerebellum. So a lot of a lot of stuff is going on in this this uh, this area of, of the I beg your pardon uh, in this area uh, with the cerebellum and of course uh, basal ganglia which is let's say the the, the cousin of cerebellum is right here and you can see that thalamus is the place where these two come together.
The second uh, schematic diagram of interest is this one here. Uh, somehow the text on, on this part uh, is not here, but this means this here is planning while this here is execution. So it is divided into basically two components. One is this and the other is this. Okay. So this, this is execution while this is planning. Okay. Let me just rub this off. So what's happening here? If you can see that lateral cerebellum is under the planning uh, component while intermediate cerebellum is in under the execution element. Okay. So just to give you the overall view, lateral cerebellum as you, you saw in the lateral hemispheres, that part of cerebellum, it is connected with all the planning machinery of the uh, of the movement so whichever parts uh, of the of the uh, brain are are concerned with planning of the motor uh, movement they include lateral cerebellum okay and it's mentioned here these cortical association areas which you'll study under cerebral cortex basal ganglia which is up next premotor and motor cortex you now know all of this together with lateral cerebellum uh, they basically put the plan uh, together uh, for execution now who does who is who, which of the structures are are responsible for the execution of the of the movement again premotor and motor are there uh, then intermediate cerebellum is that bread and butter component of the cerebellum which uh, 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 in detail is is connected with what is happening at the effector so at the at the level of muscle whatever you have sent from up there down to the level of muscle it's the intermediate cerebellum that keeps track of this whether that signal uh, reached the the muscles fully whether there was a, a depreciation which needs to be uh, covered up patched up it's all part of cerebellar uh, cerebellum and intermediate cerebellum is that is that part okay it's just like having a backup battery uh, so you have a you have a source of uh, current for a device, right? Uh, stabilizer. Stabilizer is a good. It, it's. Uh, I don't know if you understand the term in in Pakistan. The word stabilizer. It's it's a machine, which basically stabilizes the current uh, to a device. So if you have a refrigerator, okay, or a microwave, whatever, an electronic equipment, right? Uh, in these parts of the world, the current fluctuates sometimes. Okay, sometimes you get a surge. Uh, which is obviously not good for the uh, equipment and then there is some sometimes the current sort of goes down in amplitude um, we have these things called stabilizers uh, which basically do what they do is they average out the signal before the thing enters into the electronics so between the source of the current and the equipment you have the stabilizer in between it just averages things out so that you have a constant current stream to your electronic to save it to to increase its life uh, think of the intermediate cerebellum as that part. It's always there to patch up whatever uh, up and down of the main motor signal may happen to come to the muscle uh, from the topmost areas of the brain. Okay, this is like a backup stabilizer thing. If there is a deficiency, it will just patch it up. All right. Okay. So this is the anatomy of the cerebellum. This is by no means an exclusive anatomy lecture. This is physiology. So uh, we reserve the term uh, physiological anatomy or functional anatomy. So we will we'll, we'll be just looking at anatomy which enables us to understand its structure. Okay, let me just adjust this camera so that you have a better view. All right. This picture is, this diagram is from Guyton. You can easily see it from there. Okay, so if you look at this, this is a uh, rather very gross uh, picture of the cerebellum. It shows the position of the cerebellum right here as the uh, oft uh, nicknamed hind brain, okay, which is posterior to the pons. This is the brain stem here. This is the pons, okay, and this is the medulla. And this here, this whole thing where my cursor is moving, this is the cerebellum, okay this is a lobe called the anterior lobe it will be it's apparent here because it's anteriorly placed 
posterior to it, this whole big thing here, which is the majority of the cerebellum, is the posterior lobe. And tucked underneath the posterior lobe is the floconodular lobe. Okay. Now, this is the lateral view, of course. Uh, this here is the posterior view. In this, you can see that it's uh, like a butterfly, isn't it? The cerebellum is like a butterfly, which is sitting on a tree uh, branch or something, right? So let's let's see what the butterfly is composed of. So here, if you can see this sulcus here, this this strong line here, this divides the anterior lobe, which is this, from the big posterior lobe. Let me just draw it so that you can have a good appreciation of what's going on. So this is the line. This is line. This whole thing, this whole thing is anterior lobe, while this whole thing is the posterior lobe. Okay? If this is clear, let me clear this out. Uh, this thing here, right here, is the vermis. It's called the vermis. Okay? This is the vermis, uh, and there you have it. These big chunks are called hemispheres. So these are the lateral hemispheres, which are basically composed mainly of the posterior lobe, but part of the, uh, if anatomy is the main concern, part of anterior uh, lobe as well, but major chunk is composed of the posterior lobe. These lateral hemispheres, these are important. And the T fig or D branch, is basically the flo floconodular lobe which in the posterior view looks like just a a, 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 a disc like thing uh, this is the floconodular lobe okay right with anatomy out of the way um, let's get back to main physiology this is a very important diagram this whole thing here uh, and as I as I have been talking about uh, the spatial representation of the body along uh, cerebral cortex in my previous lectures uh, a similar spatial arrangement is present in the cerebellum as well, where the whole body is represented along uh, the vermis uh, and adjoining areas of the vermis. Okay, so this, as you can see, uh, the, ac the axis, the long axis of the body, let me just clear this out. The long axis of the body is represented in the center of the ver uh, ver uh, 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 vermis here as well. While the limbs, as you can see here, 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 the limbs are uh, controlled or coordinated or uh, uh, whatever cerebellum does with limbs, it happens from areas adjoining the vermis. This is just a spatial representation of how the body is represented inside the cerebellum. So from this slide onwards, we'll dive in a bit into the inside of the cerebellum. Uh, and when we go from outside to in, the first layer that we come across uh, is the cerebral cortex. Uh, and cerebral cortex lies on the outside and inside there are the there is the deep tissue of the cerebellum which uh, uh, which features the deep nuclei. Now uh, cerebral cortex is divided into three layers. These are the three layers. This is a bit of detail which I'll come to uh, in a bit. These three layers, namely molecular layer, is the outermost layer, i.e. when you are coming from outside to in, this is the first layer that you will come across, molecular layer, followed by the in the middle, there will be Purkinje cell layer, and on in the innermost part of the cortex, you will have the uh, granule, granular layer or granule cell layer. Okay. Now, and deeper to that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the deep tissue, so this is the cortex, this here is the cortex, right? And deeper to that, this here is the deep tissue, which features the deep nuclei of the cerebellum, very important. Now, so this bit is done, we, we know what the cerebral cortex uh, entails in terms of layers. Now let's get into a bit of detail let me just uh, magnify this diagram a bit for you so we are looking at this diagram now let me remove this so the emphasis now is here as you can see this is the outermost part of the cerebellum and as we go in we are going towards the 
deep tissue this year this year is the the cortex the cerebellar cortex mind you okay so now from outside to in the outermost layer which is this which is very really thick layer here right all all of this is the molecular layer okay and this between the two dotted lines is the purkinje cell layer in the middle and then you have the uh, granular layer here and as you go uh, uh deeper you have the deep tissue okay it's it's uh, it's denoted here as well okay now in the molecular layer you have uh, two types of cells uh, one is the stilet cell and the other uh, is the basket cell okay as as you can see the shape it's like a basket and stilet is like a star okay now what else is in there what else is in the molecular layer is are the are the dendrites uh, uh, fan like dendrites okay of the purkinje cell so this is the purkinje cell in its entirety this is the cell body this is its long exon and these are the dendrites like trees fanning up into the molecular layer so as you can see purkinje cell is really it's it spans uh, through all the layers of your uh, cortex and even uh digs deep down into the deep tissue as well so purkinje cell is like one of the main characters here of the cerebral cortex so you need to be very familiar with it okay so again these are the fan like structures uh, uh the dendrites okay now this is what uh, needs to be known for the molecular layer okay now as far as the purkinje layer is concerned as as i mentioned the purkinje cell uh, is the main feature of uh, of this layer purkinje cell is uh, uh, by nature inhibitory it secretes the it uses the neurotransmitter gaba okay and uh, it forms the efferent pathway for the cerebellum now this is something which may confuse you but just just stay with me uh, and let me just repeat it i will explain it uh, in a few slides when we'll talk about the efferents of the cerebellum for now uh, it's it should suffice that it's the purkinje cell via the deep nuclei placed here that constitute the efferents i e the pathways that leave the cerebellum okay right so there must be efferents you you may think and yes there are efferents if i may just point them out to you right now inside the cerebellum there are two types of efferents one you can see is in this yellow light yellow color and if you can just trace it up so it 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 enters from the of the deep side and I'll, uh, it, that is the gross anatomy of the cerebellum it's evident that all the entries are from the brain stem and hence the uh, deep tissue comes first if you are an afferent and then if you want to travel along you will be traveling towards the cortex naturally so this is coming from the deep tissue it ascends and ascends rather climbs okay and goes up to the molecular layer and there as you can see it also branches like a tree alongside the purkinje fib uh, purkinje dendrites okay this is an important point this is called the climbing fiber we'll come back to this when we'll discuss the neuronal circuitry of the cerebellum uh, which will be another video okay this is just the anatomy video I'll, i'm just introducing the tech where is it how is it placed its orientation how does it work that's the next video inshallah the other input afferent inside the cerebellum is the mozi fiber as you can see it comes up uh, it rather interacts with the uh, granular cell here and then again the granular cell takes the, the takes the message and again projects itself uh, to form the parallel fibers of the uh, uh, cortex molecular layer okay this is the this is the architecture of the of this whole thing now uh, let's come back to the cortex we we mentioned molecular layer we mentioned the two cells and the dendrites of the purkinje cell then we mentioned the uh, purkinje cell layer in which there the there is the cell body we mentioned a bit about the purkinje uh, cell itself and then uh, one thing which remains is the uh, granular layer so the granular layer as you can see 
it constitutes two types of cells one is these golgi cells okay and you can see how they uh, are branching out again into the molecular and also uh, amongst the amongst themselves inside the granular layer and then you have the granular layer which i just mentioned uh, as uh, in the path of mozi fiber now these two cells golgi and granular cell are the most abundant uh, inside the uh, granular layer okay in fact granular cells are so abundant so packed uh, quantitatively speaking in numbers that they exceed the number total number of neurons uh, in the uh, in the cerebral cortex and you know cerebral cortex is, it's so huge so entire number of neurons in the cerebral cortex uh, are on one side and granular cells of the cerebellum inside one layer the the granular layer inside the cortex of the cerebellum they outnumber the entire neurons of the cerebral cortex this goes to show you the amount of connectivity that granular cells provide and uh, goes to show you how busy the cerebral cortex really is okay now uh, we'll finish this off by oops we'll finish this off by mentioning the deep nuclei deep nuclei of the cerebellum which are depicted here rather non specifically but just uh, the next slide will explain to you exactly where these nuclei are and uh, along with their names of course uh, uh, we here we'll just name them deep nuclei one is vestigial the other is interposed then dentate and vestibular okay before i uh, go uh, to explain the vestibular nuclei why are they here under the cerebellum something which i have actually described under my vestibular operators uh, video let me just uh, uh, identify that interposed nucleus composes of two further uh, divisions one is the globose nucleus and then emboliform all of this will be better explained in an anatomy class however in the next slide we will show uh, we will see the actual location of these cells and uh, of these nuclei and what they look like so uh, i think that that will augment your learning uh, to to uh, to an to an extent that it's enough for physiology okay coming back to vestibular now uh, one may one may question why are the vestibular nuclei which are anatomically part of the brain stem uh, feature here in the cerebellum as i mentioned before uh, in my earlier lectures vestibular nuclei have such a to and fro relationship with cerebellum that functionally physiologically we actually many books uh, include the vestibular nuclei under the deep nuclei of the cerebellum okay however we note that anatomically they are part of the brain stem so as i was mentioning uh, this is the actual anatomical diagram Uh, from one of my favorite uh, illustrators uh, dr netter md um in this he clearly shows a a uh, a cross section of the cerebellum and as you can see these are this is the cortex okay these are these ridges these troughs and ridges these are the this is the outermost part and this is the cortex basically invaginating into the this light cream color substance this is the deeper tissue of the cerebellum this entire thing here this entire thing here is the deeper tissue while the the serrations and this uh, slightly darker gray uh, darker uh, darker brown uh, structure this is the cortex cerebellar cortex okay now uh, we need to concentrate on this bit here the deep nuclei okay this is what uh is going on right here okay obviously they are on both parts i'm i'm just focusing on one part here okay now vestigial is the middle is uh, in the middle in the midline of the of the whole structure right here this is vestigial nucleus okay of the left side then you have globose which are these two dots really here and here emboliform is right here way right next to the globose nucleus and then you have the dentate which i told you was like a denture this is this whole thing is the 
dented nucleus. Okay. Uh, one thing that uh, needs to be discussed, uh, mentioned here rather, is that um, these nuclei, they have, they correspond with certain areas of the cerebellum. So in anatomy, you'll be, you'll be, since when you will dissect it out and when you look at detailed cross sections of the cerebellum, you will find that various areas of the cerebellum, they correspond with their specific deep nucleus or nuclei. Okay. So these are not randomly placed or randomly connected. They have a very specific hierarchical structure. So we have done uh, the inside, uh, the st architecture of the inside of the cerebellum. Now we would like to know uh, its relations, its surrounding, its neighbors, uh, who sends what and to where, okay? Uh, that's one aspect, the afferents, which is uh, the focus of this slide. Uh, and then uh, a few f uh, slides down, we would also like to know uh, what comes out of cerebellum. So uh, one is what it receives, the messages, uh, and the other is what does it do, its output, that, that is under the efferents. Right, so we start with afferents. Uh, with afferents, there are two divisions basically. Uh, one group of afferents is from the various parts of the CNS itself, of the brain itself, and the other is the rest of the body through the spinal cord, okay? So these are the main two divisions uh, I would like you to uh, keep in mind uh, while we are studying the afferents. So this slide uh, deals with afferents from the other parts of the brain as I just mentioned. Uh, it, it looks like a very tedious looking slide but uh, what you need to do is look at the colored uh, portion only because uh, really the other stuff is uh, anatomical which we have already done. We have done the lobes, anterior, posterior and flocculodular lobes so you have you don't need to focus on that. Uh, it, one, one, one thing is the peduncles. It, these are like the portals, the, the canals or the access points. Uh, there are three, superior, middle and inferior. Nothing to it. The details will be done in anatomy. What exactly goes through it and this, that, the other. However, we are here only concerned with, well, there are three ways to enter or leave uh, the, uh, the cerebellum and these are the superior and uh, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. So that information is also not coded here. <clears throat> the information that is coded is only the afferent. So there is, there is th these two yellow ones, very important actually, uh, cerebropontile tract. So this is the tract which comes from, starts from cerebral cortex and ends in the nuclei of the pons or the pontile nuclei. So a tract which connects cerebral cortex to pons through this tract, this tract is called cerebropontile tract. Okay. Then from these nuclei, so it's a continuity actually, uh, and he indeed mentions the whole word corticopontocerebellar tract, but let's divide it down to first cerebropontile tract as I, as I just explained. And then there is the second one, the pontocerebellar. So from these nuclei, another tract comes. So first order neuron is from cortex to uh, nuclei of the pons. Then second order is from the pons to the cerebellum. Okay. okay. Collectively, they are they can be called cerebropontocerebellar tract. But in in essence, you know that these are two different tracts. Uh, functionally, they are the same. Uh, functionally, they they function. Uh, as a unit, i.e. they connect uh, the cerebral cortex to the cerebellum via the pons. Okay? So these are done. Uh, very similarly, you have the connection of uh, uh, vestibular operators, uh, 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 I beg your pardon, the vestibular nuclei uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the brainstem to the cerebellum, so vestibulocerebellar tract. Similarly, the olives of the brainstem and the reticular formation of the brainstem are also connected extensively with the cerebellum through the olivocerebellar and reticulocerebellar tracts. So these are the three main tracts uh, as far as uh, functional anatomy is concerned. 
that uh, that uh, require a mention. These are very important, especially the cerebrofrontal cerebellar tract. Okay. Now, uh, a bit more about the entire uh, the structure, the relations, the pathway. Everything is mentioned. I think in Guyton as well, uh, but mostly in anatomical books. Uh, but just to just to tell you uh, uh, a little detail about the origins of this particular tract because this goes to show you what is going on uh, when we talk about the functions uh, of the cerebellum so this originates from the motor areas okay uh, the cerebral motor m1 and the premotor areas okay and then also uh, it has a, a few tracts coming from the somatosensory area so the the in the type of information that cerebro Ponto cerebellar tract brings to the cerebellum you can imagine now from where is it originating you can imagine the type of information that cerebellum is given so this is obviously something new for you why does the cerebellum require uh, uh, the motor uh, information which is basically destined for the muscles we have studied corticospinal tract okay rubrospinal tract and so on and so forth so what's what's going on in the cerebellum now we hear that there is a copy of that message which is supposed to go down to the muscles and do all those contractions that we've been talking about but now we know that a copy of that is sent to the cerebellum so yes it it's absolutely true and now you'll start to form your image of the cerebellum as the uh, the helper the stabilizer uh, the hybrid battery or the battery of the cerebral cortex okay it is the smart intelligent accessory to the cerebral cortex uh, especially in muscle contractions especially when controlling the muscles uh, especially when uh, um, analyzing the uh, proprioception sensations coming up okay so it uh, it augments the cerebral cortex in the motor and sensory functions that it performs as far as uh, muscle muscles are concerned okay and one of these things are mentioned here uh, we will uh, discuss it in a bit of detail in the next slide but he has mentioned it let's let's just say it here although it's not part of the brain however it's important for you to have this uh, mention here to have a holistic thing so these three tracts are from other parts of the brain that's done that's the main feature of this uh, slide however just a footnote look at these two ventral spinocerebellar tract and dorsal spinocerebellar tract so look at the name spinocerebellar so it's a sensory tract coming from the spinal cord going into the cerebellum one is ventral one is dorsal so just log it away right now so that we can uh, come back to it uh, in the in the next slide that these two pathways they ascend the spinal cord and enter into the uh, uh, cerebellum basically bringing their sensory information back to this uh, unconscious part of the brain mind you which augments the seat of consciousness cerebral cortex so it's a very interesting combination Uh, these are the afferents from periphery that I was talking about. This is not part of the brain. This is from the periphery. Uh, and in here, you see the dorsal spinocerebellar tract and the ventral spinocerebellar tract, okay, going up the spinal cord and entering into the cerebellum. Now, there are uh, a few uh, differences. And so, uh, the, the dorsal and the ventral spinocerebellar tracts, uh, the dorsal one, uh, is 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 enters as you can see that goes up the ladder and it enters into the cerebellum through the inferior peduncle inferior cerebellar peduncle while the ventral goes up and enters via the superior cerebellar peduncle as of these two tracts within the cerebellum is is also uh, specific in the sense that the dorsal tract uh, while it enters through the inferior peduncle uh, it distributes along the vermis and the intermediate zone okay while the ventral tract uh, entering from the superior peduncle uh, 
it 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 it's more uh, generic it's more uh, generalized in its distribution so it covers most parts of the cerebellum uh, last point of the uh, of uh, in uh, from the anatomical point of view is that dorsal tract uh, uh, enters and distributes itself on the side of its entry so it ascends ipsilaterally and it uh, dis it's, it terminates on the same side of its traveling so the word is ipsilateral same side however the uh, the ventral tract the ventral tract it ascends ipsilaterally but distributes on both sides of the cerebellum so both hemispheres both sides right uh, more on these tracts as we go along uh, so this is the ventral spinocerebellar tract very important uh, signals transmit uh, transmitted are the motor signals arriving in the ventral horns of the descending tracts uh, this you may find peculiar uh, so what happens is let me just go back to the this slide what happens is ventral tract ventral spinocerebellar tract has a very interesting function it is it has it it keeps on looking at what has appeared what has been sent from the higher highest motor centers to the uh, ventral horn motor nuclei alpha and gamma both okay so it's like a it's like a regulator a check and balance kind of uh, inspector this ventral spinocerebellar tract is uh, it's right there and it keeps uh, an eye on the all those signals motor signals that are coming on the ventral horn okay and it immediately sends a copy of those so as soon as where has he shown this so this this is the ventral horn right right here and you can see the proximity with the ventral horn here it's right here it's right here okay now as soon as a, a motor signal were to arrive here at this point let me show it with an arrow so motor signal arriving at ventral horn and this is where the ventral spinocerebellar tract is originating it okay so as you can see the proximity fine let's clear this let's go back to our slide so <clears throat> as soon as the motor signal comes it makes a copy of it you can maybe imagine a photocopying machine okay uh, it makes a copy of that and sends it back so while the motor signal is going downwards and onwards through the muscle this copy which is which has been made by the ventral spin spinocerebellar tract is taken and sent back up but now it will not go all the way to the cortex it will actually go to the cerebellum remember the accessory function that i was talking about cerebellum being the intelligent uh, add-on to the cerebral cortex this is where this is one of the big examples of that okay it's this copy is called the efference copy it appraises the cerebellum of what has arrived on the ventral horn from the cortex then it matches the two what does it match what is that second thing the efference copy is matched with remember i talked about when i was talking in the afferents <clears throat> i talked about the uh, cerebro ponti uh, pontile uh, uh, cerebro ponto cerebellar tract cortico cortico ponto cerebellar tract and i mentioned that it gives a copy of whatever plan that was made in the uh, motor areas and which was destined for the muscle but a copy on on the way a copy is sent to the cerebellum that copy is sitting there a copy of the original motor message right that copy is is matched with the efference copy so the message or the signal that was emitted by the motor cortex fresh that is stored via the cortico pontile cerebellar tract and stored there for a while and then what arrived at down there at the spinal cord ventral horn so the efference copy is matched uh, with the original message uh, from the cortex 
and whatever deficiency that uh, the cerebellum will find uh, between the original and the efferent copy the cerebellum adds to it the cerebellum actually adds to that deficiency uh, so what is the net result the net result is when you start a new movement uh, it's not very optimal in its beginning however just after a while it becomes more optimal how it how does it become more optimal or more strong is because now the cerebellar input uh, uh, comes in alongside the original cortex uh, motor cortex uh, uh, input okay so this is the importance of efferent copy we move on to the dorsal spino cerebellar tract oops uh, basically everything that you read about muscle spindles uh, also gto uh, the the muscles and the fascia which uh, cover the muscles all of this information a copy of it is sent to the cerebellum as well alongside cortex so now you know the um, why is it called the small brain okay so all the stuff that is received in the cerebral cortex is also received in the cerebellum okay and all the stuff that it carries uh, we, we know what muscle spindle does so everything about muscle contraction the degree of tension to the tendons via the gto positions and rate of movement forces acting on the surface from the skin fascia all of this is sent to the cerebellum uh, finally the efferents now efferents again um, as we have just studied the deep nuclei you can see the dentate nucleus here uh, the vestigial uh, nucleus here okay so there is a, there are a variety of uh, fibers that come out of the cerebellum important diagram in my opinion is this one it's not given in guyton by the way this diagram shows you how these lobes and their efferents uh, uh, match with the corresponding deep nuclei so for example the vestigial nuclei they receive or they are let's say connected with the vermis area it's it's ni it's nicely color coded as well so the ver the vermis the efferents from the vermis go through the vestigial nucleus that's the way to say it okay uh, the intermediate zones on both sides they are basically uh, 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 connected with the uh, interposed uh, nuclei okay uh, and these big pink areas the lateral hemispheres they are connected with the dentate nuclei okay and then floconodular lobes are connected with the vestibular nuclei okay so this is the uh, in my opinion it's a very important physiological slash anatomical linkage of the individual lobes of or the individual areas and how they relate with the corresponding deep nuclei uh, this is uh, what <clears throat> uh, is important in the anatomy of the cerebellum in the next uh, video and lecture we will talk about the internal circuits of the cerebellum and how does it do its magic uh, exactly okay thank you